This is the second segment of the liturgy. It's called the Liturgy of the Word or the Liturgy of the Catechumens. And you will find a bunch of readings directed towards those newcomers to the faith. What are those readings? A selection from St. Paul. Remember, St. Paul wrote how many epistles in the New Testament? You should know this from last time. 14, right? And St. Paul wrote to specific persons or specific churches. And then we select something from what we call the Catholic epistles. The Catholic epistles. And they are, very easy to remember, Peter, John, James, and Jude. Remember? Peter, John, James, and Jude. These apostles, they wrote to the whole world. That's why we call their epistles the Catholic epistles. Catholic meaning universal, transcending any barriers. And then we read a selection from the book of Acts. Who wrote the book of Acts? St. Luke. Good. After that, we read from the Synexarium. The Synexarium is filled with stories of the lives of the saints whom we learn from. Those who were crowned, those who won the race and achieved success in spirituality and atta attained the kingdom of heaven. So you'll find in that book many lives of saints and feasts and fasts, so we know where we are in the life cycle of the church as well. After the Synexarium, we have a psalm and the gospel of the day. But before we get to the psalm and gospel of the day, there's even a prayer before the gospel, what we call a litany of the gospel. That's how important the word of God is. So we have this litany where Abuna prays and he says, many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which you see and have not seen them. And then at the end he says, may we be worthy to hear and to act according to your holy gospels. To hear and to act. So during the chanting of the gospel, you'll find that there's two candles on either side because what is the gospel? It's the teaching of Christ. It's the word of God and Christ is the light of the world. He enlightens every heart and every mind. It also reminds us of the five wise virgins who came prepared and had their lamps lit, lit and trimmed and prepared to receive the bridegroom who came at midnight. But when the gospel is being chanted, and by the way, it's not read, it is chanted so that we can meditate on every word that's being instructed. And should you walk in during the time of the gospel, what should you do? You should not take your place. You should stand still at the door of the church in reverence to the word of God that's being chanted. So you guys, if you walk into the church with your, with your parents and your parents say, let's go, let's take our seat. Say, no, Baba, Mama, Abuna instructed us that during the chanting of the gospel, we have to stand still in reverence until the end and then we can take our seat. It's okay to say that because that's the proper thing to do during the time of the gospel reading. You'll also notice that Abuna will take off his vestments, his vestment hat, his tailasana, or his, I don't know if it's during vespers or matins, um, again, in reverence to the word of God. But why are we standing during the gospel? All the other readings were sitting, but during the gospel it's really important. What does standing represent? I told you last time, there are three things that standing represents. It's an old custom right to stand in the presence of authority. The president, the king, the pope, in authority. Well, how much more authority can, can the word of God be? It is the highest authority. So we're standing in reverence. Number two, standing position reminds us of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is for our salvation. And number three, the standing position is kind of a posture where you're going to begin to act. You're going to move. Right? Sitting, you're relaxed, but when you're standing, you're about to move, which reminds us that what we hear in the gospel, we should be prepared to apply. We should be prepared to enact, to put into action. Okay, after the gospel, there's a sermon on the gospel, right? And the clever fathers are those that are able to put the themes of all the readings together and to present a nice homily, kind of a thread, because all of them really relate to a theme. And then after the sermon, uh, Abuna will pray to himself, or inaudibly, what's called the three long litanies inside the sanctuary. As, uh, if there's two priests, then one will be praying it inaudibly while the gospel is being chanted. And then after that, that concludes uh, the second segment of the liturgy. But you have to know that during this time, Abuna is doing circuits around the altar with the censer. He goes around the altar three times. And then he comes out around the church, all around the church one time, and then goes back for one last time around the altar. 
Why does he go all around the church during this time when the Pauline is being read? Is because St. Paul, when he preached, he preached where? All around the world. All around the world. During the Catholic epistle, there's no sensing. When we get to the Acts, the Acts of our Fathers, when we read that piece, the priest once again goes around the altar three times, sensing, and then he comes out, and he doesn't go all the way around the church. If you notice the second time, he does what? He senses just in the front section here, which reminds us of the apostles that Christ our Savior, he had told them to not go beyond Jerusalem and Judea until the Holy Spirit comes to them, in which case they can go and spread Christianity all the way around the world. And so that symbolizes that the apostles didn't go far at first. And then Abuna, before he goes back into the sanctuary, he pauses with the censer. And as he's pausing, this reminds us of those apostles that never made it back to Jerusalem. The only one really who wasn't martyred was St. John the Evangelist. All the others were what? They were martyred outside of, uh, or at least they were all martyred, so they never made it back. So we are kind of remembering them by his pause here with the censer. So Abuna is sensing. When he's sensing, he's sensing the icons, because who are the icons? What are these icons? They are images of Christ, right? All of these saints are images of Christ. So Abuna is sensing them, giving glory to them, but he's also sensing the people. Why is he sensing the people? Because the people are icons of Christ as well, yes? We are reflections of the light of Christ too. So Abuna is sensing. And while he's doing that, he's collecting the prayers of the people, and then he's offering the prayers on the altar. When you see that smoke going up high, you're reminded of our prayers being lifted up to heaven. By the way, if you count the circuits, the number of time he goes around, uh, the altar and the church it goes around seven times seven times and those seven times reminds us of the Old Testament um, if you remember Joshua when he led his people around the walls of Jericho seven times and they were blowing the trumpets and, the, and then what happened the walls came crumbling down just so too we are saying that through our prayers the wall of sin is coming down so that we are reconciled with God again so there's a lot of meaning behind the action of Abuna going around with the censor and the number of times he goes around. Okay, so that is the second segment called the Liturgy of the Catechumen, or Liturgy of the Word. We're going to continue the liturgy now, and then we'll stop another couple of times and describe to you what's going to happen. <laughs>